What's up, what's up Church 110 family? Welcome to our live stream service this morning. My name is Angela and before our speaker comes on, we have a few quick reminders. First, in addition to our live stream, we will be having service today at 10 a.m. once our live stream ends. We're taking the necessary precautions to hold service in a safe and healthy way and we would love to see you there. Also, don't think we forgot about our next generation. If you are a parent or a caregiver to a middle or high school student, we have weekly videos and family guides for you to check out each Sunday. You can find that on our website at church110.com under the C110 Next tab at the top. And whether you're a new believer or have been for years, we would love to connect with you on Thursday nights during our digital small group sessions to talk, laugh, learn, and pray together. You can find more information to join on our website. And if you're not already, be sure to follow us on social media at church.110. And don't forget to like, share this video, hit the subscribe button, and stay up to date on all C110 content. But we know it's more than follows that connects people. So we created a Facebook group that encourages interaction, community, and growth. You can also find the link to join in the description below. Lastly, if you would like to give to C110, you can click the link below to give online or visit our website at church110.com. Thanks again for tuning into our service today and we hope you enjoy. Here's Minister RJ. All right. Thank you so much, Angela. Appreciate you uh, opening things up for us. Listen, Apostle Johnson is taking the, the week off. Uh, so unfortunately, or fortunately for some, you're stuck with me, all right? I'm Minister RJ uh, Rodney II. <laughs> and um, we're gonna dive in into service really, really quickly uh, here in a second. But there's just a few things that I wanted to mention, all right? So like Angela said, if you would like to give, we would really, really appreciate it. We have so much that we're doing. We have so much work that we're putting in uh, to be able to advance the gospel, not just the church, but to be able to help people that are in need because there's so many. Um, and anything that you can give to us, where if, if God touches you, uh, if he if he if he touches your heart, we would appreciate it because it goes to a special place. It goes to uh, feeding families. It goes to helping kids. We have so many things that are on the list that we want to be able to do as an organization and as a church and as a family. But we need your support. Thank you if you already have given. But I want to encourage those that are watching to continue to give, continue to be a part, continue to support us because there are so many things that we're looking to do, right? So um, please, by all means, if you feel led to give, we appreciate it and we want to thank you in advance. One more thing before we get into it, I want to encourage you to follow us on our social media pages at church.110, that's church.110 on all of our social media platforms. But here's the thing, here's the thing. We have a Facebook group, all right? It's called C110 Family you got to be a part. The reason why is because with everything going on with, with COVID-19, connecting and engaging with you, and people like you is our top priority. We don't, we don't want to make it seem like we're only reaching out to you on Sundays. We got to keep that connection going. We got to keep that, that connection thriving. I want to laugh with you. We want to talk with you. We want to learn. We want to, we want to know more about you on our Facebook group, right? So after this, we're gonna have a link down in the description on this YouTube channel. It'll be right below me. Click it, follow us. We wanna meet you. We wanna talk to you. We wanna learn from you. We wanna ask you questions. The reason why is because we wanna grow with you, all right? So follow us, tune in with us, connect with us, engage with us, interact with us. I guarantee you won't regret it. Look, I'm excited. I'm over here hitting tables and stuff, right? So, so well, look, I'm gonna dive into it. Uh, but first, I'm gonna pray. Um, so if you would pray with me while you're at home, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we, we thank you for giving us a chance to call you Father. God, we thank you for moving in a mighty way. We thank you, God, for speaking to us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, dive through the camera lens, dive through the camera sensor, dive through the, through the technology, the wires, the Wi-Fi signals. God, dive through time, and I pray that your spirit would touch somebody that is watching this sermon. Uh, that your spirit, Lord, would move, would encourage, uh, would, would encourage people to persevere, encourage people to love you, and, and they would feel your love through this sermon and through this, uh, through this time, through this online stream, God. We just thank you, Father, for this day, for this Sunday morning, and all that you're doing, all you're going to do. Uh, in Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. Amen. All right, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
I'm going to be talking about one word, bigger, all right? B-I-double-G-E-R, bigger, all right? But here's the thing, here's the thing. I'm going to be talking about God being bigger than your current circumstances. Now, now here's, here's the problem. I can't guarantee that I'm going to be less than 25 or 30 minutes, okay? But if you stick with me, if you stick with me, everything's going to be all right. Apostle's done a really good job of keeping things under a certain time limit. I can't promise I'm going to do all that, but I'm going to do my best, all right? So um, just stick with me, all right? So we're going to be coming from Luke chapter 24, verse 39. And before I read it, I want to set up the context, okay? So we're, t we're, we're, we're focusing on a certain time in Jesus's life. Uh, now, we all we all know Jesus. So we understand what he did to a certain extent, hopefully. Um, but we all understand that he was born and he came and he ministered and uh, he, he performed so many different miracles. And there came a time in his life where he knew that he had to die. He knew he was going to be sacrificing his life. Now, that's the window that I really want to focus in on right now, because it's such a somewhat dark time if you're not careful like it seems like it's a dark time whenever Jesus laid down his life whenever he the the, the moments before his actual crucifixion um, that time is very very significant and so this is a this is a time after after the last supper whenever he was sitting down with his disciples and what was interesting was preceding his last supper he was also anointed OK, there's we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the four Gospels. And there's in one of the Gospels, Jesus was anointed um, by one of the female believers uh, and she broke the alabaster box on his feet. And there was perfume on his feet and she wiped it off with his hair. And and after that, you have the uh, the Last Supper. And then after that, everything mounts up to a point in this particular context. And it's really, really interesting because at this point, go with me at this point. The weight of the entire universe, the weight of all of mankind is on the shoulders of one man. Dying on the cross for our sins was something that only he could do, but it's also something he was born to do. OK, so so here's the thing. This is a moment where Jesus, where the the divine nature and his human nature, they, they conflict. And they come, they come colliding with each other at the exact same time. And now he's having to, now he's having to fight and battle with his divine nature and his human nature and to see which one wins. Now just go with me, all right? So at this point, they just had the uh, they just had the, the Last Supper, and he walks with his disciples, uh, 11, not 12, because that's a totally different story. He walks with his 11 disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane was also called the Mount of Olives. It was a mountain. Now, this was a this was a, a public place where many of the villagers, many of the residents of Jerusalem, they would set up uh, gardens on this mountain. And it's called the Mount of Olives because it was set up olive gardens and olive gardens and olives specifically was a very, very sacred thing to the children of Israel, to to all that, to all that lived in Jerusalem. And so with him going to the Garden of Gethsemane, I'm, I'm not going to jump ahead too much because there is a very strong significance there. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He tells Peter, James and Paul, sorry, Peter, James and John, my bad. <laughs> he tells them to stay in the garden at the base of the of the mountain while he proceeds to go pray. Now we're going to pick up where we are. And uh, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Most people don't really don't really get this immediately. The, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, which, which is also known as the Mount of Olives, all right? So I just want to make sure that that's known. The Mount of Olives is also known as Gethsemane, okay? Gethsemane in the Hebrew means um, olive plant, okay? Olive garden. And I don't want to, it means one more thing. It means one more thing, but you got to stick with me to the end, okay? Stick with me to the end and you'll get it. Now, we're going to pick up at Luke chapter 22, verse 39. And we're going to go all the way to uh, verse 34. And it reads, I'm going to try to read this like, like I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> and it reads, and he came out and went, as was his custom, talking about Jesus, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. 
and he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, meaning he wasn't very far, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, that's the very first word he prayed, Father, if you are willing, that's key, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, check this out, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, those are the circumstances. That's the context. He is about to embark on the one thing that only he can do, that only he will be able to do. And what I mean by that is he's about to endure merciless beating. He's about to endure betrayal, merciless beating to where he's whipped and bruised. The Bible says he was bruised for our iniquity. Another translation says that he was beaten so bad that you couldn't recognize him. He did this for me. He did this for you willingly. And after that, he still had to be crucified. He still had to die. He still had to be murdered. Okay. Now, those are the circumstances that he's getting ready to embark on. But now, my question to you is, what if your circumstances seem bigger than the God that you serve? What if your circumstances seem like they're insurmountable, like they're, like they're impossible? What do I mean by the word bigger? I mean stronger. I mean more capable. Get this. What I mean by stronger means deserving of more attention. What if... Your circumstances seem to you and me to deserve more attention than the God that you serve. That's a very difficult thing to grasp. But here's the thing that gives me that gives me so much, so much, I guess, solace, <laughs> so much, so much comfort is that it's natural. It's natural. It is perfectly 100 percent natural to feel in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your suffering, in the midst of all the hell that you're going through to focus on that rather than the God that you serve. So I'm not bashing anybody that's dealing with so many different things that you that you call yourself a Christian, you're a professing Christian. I'm not going to say that if you follow these steps and if you consider God to be bigger than your circumstances and in the middle of it, if you praise him in the middle of it, that if you do all these 10 steps that God is going to carry you through. I'm not going to say that. I'm not because that's not always true. And I'll get into that in a second. I guarantee you this is not going to be 30 minutes, but stick with me. All right. So here's the thing. In order for something to be bigger, you have to first have something to compare it to. In order for something to be bigger, you can have something that's big, but in order for it to be bigger, there's something else that you are comparing it to. Now, here's the thing. There is something called forced perspective. OK, forced perspective is when and I. Let me say this first before I get into the before I get into the nitty gritty of what that is. But whenever you look at something that and you're comparing it, what if what is smaller appears to be larger? What if you are in a position to where something that is minute, something that is small, pales and or, or is is more large, is gargantuan than something else that is supposed to be large and gargantuan. That's where forced perspective comes into play. Forced perspective is a technique that uses optical illusions to make an object appear farther away or closer or larger or smaller than it actually is. It manipulates human visual perception. It messes with your mind. It messes with your eyesight. It messes with your perspective through the use of scaled objects and the point of the viewer or the spectator. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there and this is a real thing. I'm not just pulling something out of a magician's hat. OK, you can look this up. There's a legitimate definition. If you Google force perspective, it's a real thing. And the thing is that we have to understand is that whenever you are and there's there's like art, art museums, there's art installations where you can go to a room that has a certain amount of depth and you can stand on one side and the other person can stand on the other. But whenever you take a picture, it seems like the person seems like one person is this big and the other person is gigantic. But that's because of the distance and that's because of where you're standing. And that's because of the focal lens that you're using on the camera. And so that 
depends on your perspective. So sometimes what may be smaller can appear to be much larger than what it actually is. If you go online, you can find people leaning up against buildings. You can find people holding the sun in their palm of their hand. You can find people flexing where there's, there's eight people that are standing on their biceps. But it's called forced perspective. It's when you are positioned in a certain place. You're positioned in a certain place and everything that is supposed to be right is off because of where you're standing, because of what you're seeing, because of your perspective. Now, forced perspective. What I want you to say and what I want you to put in the chat is our perspective matters. I stole that from Black Lives Matter. Your perspective matters, okay? Hashtag our perspective matters. But here's the thing. It's not in the good times. It's not in the good times where your perspective matters. It's all great. Your perspective is great whenever you just got money in the bank, whenever you got an unexpected check, whenever your kid graduated from college, whenever you bought a new house, a new car, whenever you just got married, whenever you graduated from school, whenever you bought new clothes, you got everything that you wanted. Your perspective is great then. Everything is fantastic. I'm looking good, feeling good, got a new haircut. I, I went and got tested for COVID-19, but it came back negative. I just survived a police encounter. Everything is fantastic. Everything is great. But your perspective doesn't matter at that point. And what am I saying? I'm saying that your perspective matters the most when it's the opposite side. After you've been molested, after you've gone through a divorce, after your car has been repossessed, after your house has been taken and you and your two kids, three kids are living out on the street. Once you don't have any food in the fridge, when you don't have money in the bank, when you've been diagnosed with, with COVID-19, when your loved one did not survive a police encounter, that's when your perspective matters the most because your perspective is then gonna dictate your actions. Your perspective is then gonna dictate the way that you think is gonna dictate your actions, everything else that follows after your perspective. What is actually bigger? What is actually bigger? But granted, listen to what I'm saying. Your perspective Focusing on the circumstances is natural. Your perspective focusing on what you're really dealing with is 100% natural. I'm not saying that you're less of a Christian. I'm not saying that you're less of a believer, that God doesn't love you, that you don't have enough faith. If you focus on all hell that's breaking loose for a moment and don't recognize the God that you serve. Jesus did it. Christ asked God to take the cup away. That was he. He. He entered a moment of forced perspective. He entered a moment where he saw that his circumstance, he saw the gravity of the circumstance. He saw though he felt the weight and the stress of his circumstance. The scripture says that because of his anguish and his agony, that an angel had to come and minister him and that he was so distressed that his sweat became like drops of blood hitting the ground. So he felt the weight of his circumstance. Let's not act like the son of man didn't understand what it was that he was doing for you and me. He felt it to the umpteenth extent in the chat room say amen if you feel what i'm saying you may really understand the circumstance that you're going through and it may seem like forget god about being forget about god being bigger it may seem like god is nowhere to be found it may seem like god does not even exist that's what i'm talking about i'm not going to give you a 10-step solution to be able to overcome your problems I'm not, because that's a magic trick i'm giving you substance here it may really seem like your circumstance is the worst that it could ever be in your life. And you're saying, God, does he? You may have been walking with God for 40 or 50 years. God, how is he bigger when it doesn't even seem like he's even in, anywhere close for me to compare him to his circumstance? Now, here's the thing. After Jesus enters into that human moment, because it is, it is, it is 100% natural. If Jesus did it, you're going to do it. Now, granted, he did it for like a split second in the same sentence. I mean, you and me, we're going to do it for a while. OK, so it's totally natural. It's totally natural. I heard somebody say it's OK not to be OK, but it's not OK to stay that way. OK, so I'm saying OK a lot, but it's a big deal. So just because Jesus entered into that, we're going to enter into that. But we cannot stay for there. We cannot stay there very long. Here's the thing. Immediately after he said, God, take this cup from me. But. Not my will, 
but your will be done. Not my will, not what I want, not my desires, your will, your plan, your agenda be done. Let it supersede what I want. True perspective is seeing God and his plan and his will as bigger than your circumstance. That's what true perspective is in, in this case, in this context, in this, in, this, in this situation, in this circumstance. Seeing God as bigger and seeing his plan as bigger than what you're currently going through, that is the right perspective to have. Because if you don't have that, then your foundation is messed up. If you don't have that, then you won't be able to make it through. Now, you may be asking, why did I choose this scripture? I didn't choose it. God did. But why this scripture? Just because we say that God is bigger than our circumstance and we truly see him as such, that is not a magical key to take us out of our circumstance. Just because you're in the middle of it and you may be praising God in the middle of it like we've been taught so many times in church. Just because you say God is bigger than my circumstance. Amen. Hallelujah. And you start shouting and jumping up and you're saying all this church stuff that people make fun of us over. And you're and you're you are full fledged, wholeheartedly saying God is bigger than my circumstance. God is bigger than what I'm going through. I serve a just and almighty, powerful God. You saying all these things and feeling good about yourself and your emotions are rising, your adrenaline is pumping and you get home. And then you sit down on the table and you still see all the bills that you're dealing with. And then you get home and you still see the diagnosis that you've been dealt. You get home and you see that your kids are running crazy, that you see that your kids have just been arrested. You see the divorce notice that your that your spouse has just served you. That's what I'm talking about. Saying that God is bigger is not a magic. It's not a magic trick. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if you believe that God is bigger, that everything's going to be OK, because it's not. And that's what that's the part that nobody wants to talk about. That's the part that everybody feels feels weird and iffy about. Nobody wants to accept the fact that God is in control. One pastor said that control for us is an illusion. It's an illusion because you don't have control and neither do I. We want to think that we do. But if you're truly a Christian, if you're really a believer and you stand on the foundation of God's word and you understand that he is he is all knowing the ancient one, the Alpha the Omega, and the Omega, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one true living God, the one being who was and is and is to come. And he and he insurmounts time and time is time has a limit because of God's mere existence. All the angels are around him saying, holy, holy, holy. If you really believe that everything the Bible says, then you would know that we are not in control. It's an illusion because whenever we try to take on control, we're taking on a weight that we cannot bear. Because control was not made for you and I. Trust was made for you and I. So he is bigger. Yeah, he is. That's great. God's bigger. He is. His plan is bigger. That's fantastic. Now what? You tell me. Now what? God is bigger than my circumstance. God is bigger than everything I'm going through. Now what? Now what do I do? Because when I get home, I still got to deal with the, with the mess that I'm going through. I want to say something else. I'm not going to say it because a lot of church people watch it. But when I get home, I still got to deal with all the crap. And I want to say something else. I'm not going to say it because there's a lot of people watching. But when I get home and I'm dealing with all the stuff I have to go through, yeah, God is bigger. But how does that, how does that become applicable to me? How am I able to work through this? How am I able to deal with this? How am I able to move forward? Am I going to be able to move forward? Am I going to be able to deal with this? Am I going to be able to be successful and make it through this? I'm almost done. In Luke, the same chapter, chapter 22, verse 40, Jesus says, the Bible says, and when he came to the place, he said to them, meaning his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. What he means by that is pray that you will not fall to your human nature. Now, here's the thing. This is this is what is so crazy. Whenever you look at the story and you look at the context, he's asking the disciples to pray that you will not fall into temptation. And what did they do? They went down there and they fell asleep. Now, one translation in, uh, I shouldn't say translation, but another book of the Bible in Mark, Jesus has to come down and tell them to pray three times. Pray that you don't fall into temptation, fall asleep. Pray you don't fall into temptation, fall asleep. Pray 
that you don't fall into temptation. Fall asleep. <laughs> so, so what, what does that even mean? To me, that tells me that this, again, I cannot stress, is natural. It's natural to look at what's going, what's going on and succumb to it sometimes. It's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. Now, here's the thing. Whenever he went down and told them that, Peter, James, and John all fall asleep three times. He tells them not to pray. He tells them to pray, excuse me, and not to fall into temptation. But, but we have to also, again, consider the surrounding context because before he said that they had just had the Last Supper, they're drinking wine, eating a bunch of bread, and they're traveling. And at this point, it's late. There's one translation that says it was about towards the end of the night, meaning that it was, it was past midnight. So they've been traveling with the Son of Man all day, all night, for months at a time, and they finally get to a spot where they can sit down and he wants them to pray. Bro, me and, I, me and you, we're going to fall asleep. I'm catching me a quick nap. What's so crazy is that they, the, the, uh, in, this, in this text, Luke says that Jesus went only a stone's throw away so they could see him. He wasn't very far. That's how I know that this is natural because human nature is what it is. You can tell me to pray. You can tell me to do these things and I will try my best Jesus. But you better believe if I just had a meal, I'm taking me a nap, bro. It's called the itis. It's a real thing. Look it up. I didn't just come up with that. It's real. All right. Now, chapter 22, verse 41, I'm moving on. It says he withdrew about a stone's throw and knelt down praying, saying, get this, father, daddy, one translation says Abba Father, which is the epitome. It's the, it is the climax of that father-son relationship. It's impossible. It is impossible. It is impossible. You cannot see God as bigger and see his plans as bigger in your current situation if you don't have a relationship with him. It's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. You will, like I said, it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. The way you don't stay that way is by having a relationship with the Father, having a relationship with God. Because without that, you will get deeper and deeper and deeper into your circumstance. And you won't see that he truly is bigger. You won't see that he truly does have the power and does have the plans. But again, let's say that you have a wonderful relationship with God. You spend time, you have incredible devotions, you, you believe in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins, you believe that he was resurrected, you believe that after you die, you will spend eternity with the Father, with the Son, you believe that God has a plan for your life, he has a purpose for your life, then you go to the doctor and you've been told that you have 24 hours to live. You've been told that you have COVID-19. Get your affairs in order, start writing your will, because it's over with. Start digging, pick your plot, go on to the, uh, to the funeral home. This just got dark, but it's real. Go on to the funeral home, pick out your casket. Do you want to be buried or do you want, do you want to be incinerated? That's because that's life. That's life. That's what I'm talking about. Once you, once you have done everything that you have, everything to your best ability that you're supposed to do, and then you get a death notice, is God bigger at that point? I cannot tell you that if you agree that God is bigger, that everything's going to be okay. But here, here, here's, here's where things get a little crazy. This is the stuff that nobody wants to admit because, again, I'm taking control out of your hands and I'm giving it to the one who really does control it. Chapter 22, verse 42, the next verse, he, Jesus says, Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Meaning, that is the moment where Jesus went like this, standing in one position, and he went like this. Because this first position, he was looking at the circumstance. He was looking at everything that was around him. And then he was like, okay, let me flip this around. Because I can't, I can't stay here. I don't even have control over this. He said, if, if it's in your will, take this cup from me. Please, I don't want to do this. And Mark says he did it three times, going to God saying, I do not want this. But you're bigger. You're in control. 
you, you have a plan. I know, I've known what the plan was before I got here. But you have a plan. Jesus saw God and his will bigger and more important than what Jesus wanted. The next verse, it says, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven. Get this, strengthening him and being in agony. He prayed even more earnestly. So it's not like it's not like just saying, God, you're bigger. Your will be done is it. That's what we do. But what God does is he meets you at that place and he gives you the grace to carry through. He gives you the grace to be strengthened, to trust and accept and be at peace with his will. Because that's that's what he's given us. He hasn't given us control. He's given us the ability to trust. And that's what we have to relinquish. But that's not the stuff that anybody wants to hear. Somebody may be like, oh, RJ's tripping now. Somebody may be tuning off, unfollowing us on Church 110. But I cannot in good faith being a Christian, being a quote unquote man of God and stand here and tell you that if you say and believe that God is bigger, that everything's going to be OK. When Christians on the other side of the world are being beheaded just for the sake of his name. I can't do that. And I won't. If you believe that God is truly bigger, if you believe his plans are truly bigger, then you have been given the grace. And I would pray that God would give you the grace to sustain, to persevere, to keep going, to keep trusting. So what happens next in this scripture? Jesus is betrayed. He's brutally beaten. He savagely murdered and hung from wood. Now, my question is, was this defeat? Was, did, he, did he lose? Did he not have the relationship like he should have had? Did he not have the faith like he should have had? Was there something wrong that Jesus did? That Jesus did because he died. Now what? I want to put a pause in that. We'll put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. There's somebody named, by the name of Annie Johnson Flint. In the late 1800s, she was born. And as she got older, she was crippled by rheumatoid arthritis for decades up until the day that she died. She first, she first was afflicted by this in her, in her late teens, early 20s. She was also diagnosed with cancer. To put the cherry on top, she also succumbed to blindness. So she was literally dependent on other people for her survival. But before she was ever diagnosed with anything, her parents passed. And she was adopted. So her entire life was just the worst that it could really be. One of the worst, if that's what I, what I want to say. Uh, the author of her, of her biography said that before she died, she was covered in boils from head to toe and had marks all on her body from being bedridden for decades. She couldn't move. She was crippled and, and disjointed and disfigured because, this, because of this affliction that was on her body. But she was also a revered poet. She wrote hymns and she was an author and a writer. And what she's most known for is this poem that I'll read to you. It's called, He Giveth More Grace. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed or the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun his love has no limit his grace has no measure his power has no boundary known unto man for out of his infinite riches in jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again this is what i want to say this is the point that i'm drilling to you i cannot guarantee you that by believing that God is bigger, everything is going to be all right. Because shortly after this, 
Annie Johnson Flick passed away. Her entire life was a life of affliction. But through the grace of God, she was able to, through her, through her life and her death, God's plans were bigger. God's plans were bigger than her circumstance. Here's the thing, because Jesus had a relationship with the Father, he was given the grace to carry on all the way to his death and his resurrection. Jesus had to die. He had to die. And that's what I wanted, that's what I drilled, what I want to drill to you at this point, is that you may not have the faith, you may not have everything that you may dream that you would need to make it through your circumstances, and God forbid your circumstances overtake you and you go home to be with God or your loved one goes home to be with God and you don't understand how, that's, how your life is going to continue. Ravi Zacharias, the late Ravi Zacharias, he was a uh, brilliant, brilliant apologist of our time. Somebody said, whatever Ravi writes, God reads. He was, he was the man. Ravi Zacharias said, the grace of God that sustains you will be the testimony that carries you ultimately to the end of the day. It's not, it's not on us. Our circumstances happen, life happens, but we have to work. It's the grace of God that aids in us changing our perspective and seeing God and His will and His plans as truly what is bigger. Now here's the thing, and I'm bringing this to a close. Remember at the beginning, I mentioned that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. Okay, this, these were the same places. Now the thing is, in this time, whenever you had these gardens, these gardens primarily for the Jews were inhabited full of olives. The entire mountain was made, uh, was, was made for the, the olive uh, gardens. <laughs> Another word for Gethsemane is olive press olive press here's the thing for the children of israel olives were sacred because everything the anointing of everything that they did came from olives you have to press the olives to get the olive oil out of it jesus was pressed at that time he was pressed all the way to the point of his death but he had the grace to carry through you may be pressed to the point of death but if you pray for God to give you the grace to shift your perspective that he would that the spirit would move in your life for you to be at peace and to recognize who's truly in control after you've done all that you can do like Fred Hammond says you stand on God's Word you stand in God Apostle says you stand in your faith Stand firm in your faith and stand firm in the faith. You have to do that because otherwise life is going to overtake you and it's going to be hell. But that does not mean that God is not bigger. And I'll bring this home and I'll end this by saying that when George Floyd was murdered, when Tamir Rice was murdered, when Breonna Taylor was murdered, when Ahmaud Arbery was murdered, the list goes on and on and on. You can say what you want about this specific movement, but I believe that those people unfortunately had to pass because of the will of God. Because after they passed, God was able to shift the perspective of the entire nation, of the entire world. People on the other side of the globe chanting Black Lives Matter, saying justice for George Floyd. But we cannot say that that would have happened if his life had not been allowed to be taken away. And that's a tough thing to understand. And by no means am I saying that your circumstances don't matter. By no means am I saying that what you're going through doesn't matter to God. Because he's right there giving you the grace to sustain you, to help you persevere, to help you keep going, because without him we are nothing. In him, 
through him, for him are all things forever and ever. So I want to I want to end this by praying um, for whoever's watching, whether you're saved or not saved, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would give you what you need just to get through the day. Just to get through the morrow, just to get through the end of the week by his grace, not by yours. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you are one of a kind. You are the true living God, and we are absolutely nothing without you. And Lord, we pray, I pray for those that are watching this sermon. You brought them here on purpose, not by accident. Regardless of what day it is, regardless of what year it is, what time it is, they are watching this for a reason. I pray, God, that you would give them the grace, give them the strength in you to trust you in whatever it is that they're going with. I'm not going to sit here and prophesy that, God, you're going to turn things around. But I'll pray, Lord, that you do if it's in your will. But if not, that you would give them the grace to trust you to make it to the finish line. And so that your will can be done and other people will be affected by your plans. So, Father, I thank you. Thank you, Father, for being who you are. We love you. We appreciate you and we adore you our King, our Father, our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, thank you so much for tuning in to Church 110, where we're generations united. Thank you for following us. I pray again that you have the grace to continue. We'll catch you next week when Apostle is back on the scene. Remember, we're all in this together. Peace. We hope you enjoyed our live stream service this morning. Just a reminder that if you would like to give to C110, just click the link in the description below or you can visit our website at church110.com. And if you're a parent or caregiver, head on over to our website and click the C110 next tab to get this week's lessons for our middle and high school students. Whether you're a new believer or have been for years, we would love to connect with you on our Thursday nights during our digital small groups sessions to talk, laugh, learn, and pray together. You can find more information to join on our website. Don't forget to follow us on social media at church.110. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and stay up to date on all C110 content. Also, check out our Facebook group for an amazing community and encouragement throughout the week. You can find the link to join in the description below. Thanks again for tuning into our service today and we hope you enjoy. We hope to see you next Sunday and have a great week.